many people feel some degree of loneliness due to social distancing, due to being afraid of venture into the public that um, keeps people from socializing. Obviously, there's been enough reasons to not socialize that we've received for the last uh, three months. So what do we do instead? Well, we basically stay cooped up at home. And some people start feeling frustrated about it. Some people start feeling cabin fever. There is something that to be said about cabin fever and a sense of loneliness that many people experience. So what do we do about it? Or what can be done about it? Well, first of all, we learn how to connect with each other like we're doing right now. We are connecting with each other through video chat or other virtual communications because it really gives us the pleasure to connect with another human being on an intimate level. And also, we remember that this is not the first best option, but it's better than nothing. This is just like people ask me sometimes, well, is it possible to learn Qigong through video communications and virtual reality or uh, some other online means? And I say, it's possible. It's not going to be the best, but certainly not the worst thing that could happen to you. It's not going to be as effective as working with a, a Qigong master face to face, but it's certainly better than not working with a Qigong master at all. Another thing that also happens is that we often are separated by geographical distances. So folks who live on the East Coast or somewhere else in the world uh, would have a harder time connecting with me or somebody who lives on the West Coast, for example. However, it's better to connect through video chat than not to connect at all. And when we do this, we can still practice. We can still practice our communication skills, our energy awareness, and expand our consciousness. How do we do that? Well, some people say the um, easy thing to do would be to just do some forms. We can do some forms together. Yesterday, I was invited by a well-known Tai Chi teacher named Violet Lee to come and be uh, a guest instructor in her virtual class. Well, I was very happy to come and appear in that virtual class. And of course, I did not teach any forms, which was kind of perplexing to her and to her students because that's what they're used to doing. What the heck did I do instead of doing forms? Well, I demonstrated something pertaining to the principles of energy awareness. In fact, I introduced several, um, well, four main principles of energy awareness involved in the particular movement, the movement called brush the knee. Brush the knee is a real, relatively simple movement that's part of pretty much every Tai Chi form I know of. It looks like this. Or if you do it more than once, then it's going to go like this, and so on. But it's not uh, something that we just do pro forma, so that it just looks like I'm making the right move. No, we actually look at the principles. Let's start with the name of this book. First of all, the name is real misnomer because it's not about brushing the knee. <laughs> the hand movement that brushes the knee is a totally secondary movement. The primary movement, the primary objective of this particular move is to project energy forward. How do I know that? Well, the primary movement, by definition, is the movement of the limb that goes in the same direction where the center of mass is moving. If the center of mass is moving sideways and I try to perform a punch forward, that's not going to be a primary movement because the movement of my body doesn't support the punch. Now, 
some people say repulse the monkey is the cool move. Well, you can only push yourself away from the monkey because the hand that's making the forward push gesture is not a primary movement. The pulling action of the other hand is actually a primary movement because it moves in the same direction of where the center mass is going. And the same also applies to brush the knee. It's the forward push that's the primary movement, not the knee brushing that's doing the primary movement. That is totally secondary or even tertiary. When you perform the primary movement in the direction of the center of mass moving in the same direction, it has power. In that you, there is the beautiful maxim called well, use the whole body power. Now, how do you use the whole body power? Well, you need to use the movements of your limbs that move in the direction where the center mass is going, so that the whole body movement will contribute to the power of the movement of your limb. If your limb is moving this way and the center mass is going elsewhere, that's not going to be primary movement. If, for example, in um, some styles, uh, they just um, step and then punch, or brush the knee, because also performed usually uh, you step and then you push. The center mass stop moving forward. So you actually are not using whole body power anymore, even if it could be primary movement because the center mass was traveling forward. But as soon as you land it and you stop the movement of the center mass in the forward direction, guess what happens? All your kinetic energy drain through the front foot into the ground and nothing is left for the hand. So you will be resorting to using force instead of power. And that is the opposite of what uh, we call harmonious culture movement. Harmonious culture movement teaches how to use power instead of force. Who wants to use force instead of power? Who wants to be forceful rather than being powerful? <laughs> this sounds like a silly proposition, right? But that's exactly what you end up with if you step first and then push. And so that's a very important little detail that is completely overlooked in pretty much every style of Tai Chi, every style of um, karate I know of, every style of Kung Fu that I'm aware of. Uh, basically, pretty much everybody steps and punches. What the heck? You have no power if you do that. It makes no sense. So how do we make it more sens sensible? Well, we actually learn how to understand the principles. And the, this particular principle requires that you land on, on, with the stepping foot on the ground after you deliver impact into your target. So you push and then land, not step and then push. How many people do you know who actually practice this? Very few. Pretty much all my students do it, and very few other martial artists or Qigong practitioners actually are even aware of this principle. Even though they might have heard numerous times the idea of using the whole body power. So there is a major disconnect. Just like the disconnect in terms of the name of this movement, I think many of these movements were actually named on purpose to confuse the students. You know, the flowery names like picking the needle from the bottom of the ocean. Sure, you can name that move in a very flowery way, but if it actually is distracting the attention from the primary objective of what this movement is supposed to do, it actually either pulls the rug from under the student or just simply doesn't give the student the chance to learn right. Now, I know some masters who actually teach the students this kind of stuff. And then maybe years or even decades later, they say, okay, 
now you are ready for me to correct you. I'm going to give you the right way of doing this. You know, all this time, you basically wasted doing things wrong, but that was done on purpose. I didn't want to teach you the right thing because the right way is a secret. Well, some people are really into secrets. I'm not into secrets. I think that the more people experience empowerment, the more people live healthy and happy lifestyles. If we disempower people by keeping them from being able to utilize the knowledge that we have, we basically create an unhappy world around us. I personally believe that the more people you help manifest and live their dreams, the more people will help you manifest and live your dreams. That's why I do my work. That's why I share all this knowledge without holding back. Now, there were several other principles that I also introduced to the class. For example, the principle of orientation. Most Tai Chi teachers and also teachers of many other disciplines say that the hand needs to be in front of the shoulder joint. Or they sometimes say, and the tip of the thumb needs to be on your center line. Well, guess what? It would be perfectly appropriate if the tip of the thumb was the weapon. If you're stabbing somebody with the tip of your thumb, then great. That is exactly where the tip of the thumb needs to be. It needs to be on the center line because the center line is like the power line of your body. It literally empowers those parts of the body that are in alignment with the center line. For example, if you try to hammer a nail and do it off center line, like this, it will be much harder to achieve the desired result as opposed to doing it right on the center line. You'll have much more precision and power using the tool, whether it's a hammer or a screwdriver or any other tool, on the center line as opposed to off center line. Now, this may not be news to you, but that's exactly what happens when people practice the form. They actually are taught to do it wrong. And so, bringing the hand just an inch or two to the center line, which part of the hand? Specifically, the Lagong point major gateway that uh, you can project energy with. If the logon point is on the center line, you will have maximum ability to project energy through a hand. If the logon point is off center line, it's not going to be so easy. And what we do is we learn how to actually pay attention to it. We call this the principle of orientation. Why do we call it orientation? It's because it's not about bringing the hand to the center line, actually. It's about bringing a center line to the hand. Why is that? Well, because the hand needs to go where the target is. <laughs> so if you are hammering a nail, you don't just hammer a nail wherever the center line is pointing. You hammer a nail where you need to hang a picture or do whatever else you need to hammer. If you are punching or making the strike with the open palm, the same thing matters just as much. You project energy over wherever your target is. That means that you need to orient your center line to align with your hand. It's all relative. So basically, it's either bringing the hand to the center line that's going to empower the hand, or bringing the center line to the hand that's going to empower the hand. That's the principle of orientation. And it's something that is completely normal and standard to pretty much every student of mine. And it's quite a foreign idea to most people practicing Tai Chi or Qigong or Taekwondo or many other similar disciplines. Why is that? I think it's because the teachers do not test the principles. And they don't invite the students to test the principles. Instead, they test the students. 
they need the students to perform the way that is similar to the way that the teacher moves. And if the student moves the way similar to the way the teacher does, they get good grade, they get a new belt, they are considered good students. If they don't move according to the formula that the teacher is supposed to present, then there is something wrong with the student, they're not learning right, they're flunking the tests, and basically uh, they're failing. They're not a good student. They don't get promoted. Now this is a really deficient way to learn because you put a lot of stress on the student and don't allow the student to actually learn stress-free. Instead, I invite my students to test the principles and find out how the principles work. When they find out how the principles work, they will reinvent the wheel because there were plenty of many generations of other people before them who done the same work, done the same testing. However, when you reinvent the wheel, you'll never forget how the wheel works. You will be able to apply this knowledge a lot more uh, consistently in your life, as opposed to just learning some particular idea or, or formula from a teacher. That's why if a person studied uh, form, it only lives in their mind for a relatively short period of time. There are so many people who studied various styles of Tai Chi, Qigong, various types of martial arts, who come to study with me and I ask them, so what did you learn in your previous studies? Can you show me your form? Well, guess what? 90% of them cannot remember what they would learned if there was any gap between the time when they studied the form and the present moment. Give them a month or two, maybe six months, maybe a year, and all that form will evaporate. But if you've tested over and over again how your hand feels empowered when it's on the center line, will you ever forget it? <laughs> I hope not. That's exactly what we do. We learn how to test the principles rather than the students. Another thing that I also introduced is the principle of stabilization. The empowerment applies not only to the hand, the empowerment also applies to the leg. Which leg? Well, the weight-bearing leg. You need to bring the weight on one of your legs, which uh, one is going to have more weight on. Well, it's going to be the one that you step forward with. So, for example, if you perform this forward push, I don't call this movement, by the way, breast the knee stroke. I call it forward push because that's the primary objective of this movement push the energy forward. If you bring the weight onto the front foot, you want to be immediately stable. Well, how do you stabilize yourself? You, you do it by empowering that leg so that it can support your weight. The weight-bearing leg, by definition, is the leg that carries anything more than 50% of your weight. Well, as I step forward, I'm going to bring more than 50% of my weight onto the stepping and guess what? I will have maximum stability if I align my center line with the toes of that foot. If the toes of that foot are somewhere else pointing out the windows or turn inwards like that, that's going to be a misalignment. How do I know that? You can just come over and push me. I can push myself over if my toes are misaligned or if the toes are uh, rotated like that outward, you just come over and, and misalign. But if I bring my weight onto the foot, when the toes are in alignment with the center line, you can push me from this direction, from that direction, from behind, from the front. I'm going to be very stable. In fact, I can just stand on one foot like this till cows come home because the toes of the foot are in alignment with the center line. That gives me maximum stability. That's the principle of stabilization. And just like the principle of orientation, it's not about bringing 
the center line and align them with the toes of the weight bearing foot to empower the foot. It's actually about bringing that foot in alignment with the center line. Why? Well, because wherever the target is, you're projecting energy towards the target with a hand. You need to orient yourself so that your center line would be in alignment with this hand and empower this hand. But you also want to be stable. How do you do that? Well, you need to bring your foot in alignment with that center line because if you turn the center line in alignment with the foot and the foot is pointing elsewhere, that means that you will be disoriented all of a sudden. So basically, it simply means that the hand and the foot also need to be in alignment with each other. Well, how many people do you see in Tai Chi or Qigong or Karate or Taekwondo or Kung Fu who actually bring the hand and the opposite foot in alignment with each other? Like this. Very few. Why? Because they don't test. If you don't test, you will have a hard time using these principles. And that's exactly what we study. We study how to operate on the basis of the principles that we understand. And when we do that, something really amazing happens. We actually create a harmonious culture, a movement. By that I mean that we actually begin to move in an effortless and harmonious manner. And as they say, you are the way you move. If you move harmoniously, you experience a harmonious way of being. Why would you want to be in harmony with the universe? Because you don't want to struggle against the universe. Struggling against the universe is kind of futile and very dangerous or painful thing. So instead of struggling against the flow of things, the Tao, we learn how to align ourselves with the Tao. That's what we also call being in the flow. So being in the flow is the primary objective of our studies. We learn how to develop the culture movement that would empower us to be in the flow. And we experience more empowerment the more aligned we are with the flow. Just like hand gets empowered when it's in alignment with the center line. What also happens is that we develop the ability to project energy in different directions with ease and efficacy. Just like I was demonstrating the projection of energy forward with a forward push. It's an easy and effortless movement when done right. When it's not done right, it's difficult or ineffective. What are examples of ineffectiveness of this movement? Well, for instance, in addition to not using all body power, here's a couple of other additional examples. For instance, if you look at me in profile, you can see how my spine is more or less in alignment with the back leg. What does that mean? It means I'm streamlined. It means that I'm not going to collapse if there is any resistance that I encounter in my movement forward. Most people, on the other hand, are really proud of keeping the course of right, whether it's in Tai Chi or in Karate or in Taekwondo or whatever, they are so happy to keep their torso upright, and somehow they believe that this is the good way to be. Now this is not, because as soon as you're encountering resistance, something funny is gonna happen. <laughs> you are going to start bending backwards, because if your torso is upright, and then you start actually trying to push or strike that reaction of the target will basically bend you backwards or you just won't have any power. Why? Because you're not using the bone structure of your skeleton to project energy. You are using force. And what happens when you use force? The muscles are never as strong as bones. And so you will never have as much power in your forceful movement. As opposed to what? As opposed to powerful movement that uses gravity and bone structure alignment in such a way that doesn't require tension. As a matter of fact, energy waves, which is also something that we learn how to project, 
don't go there easily through tense tissues. So if you're actually using force, you're creating an energy block. <laughs> Just try to tense up your arm and then push with it. That's not going to be easy. Now, if you relax your arm, then you can push very easily by sending the wave from the torso into the shoulder, from the shoulder into the elbow, from the elbow into the wrist, and from the hand into the target. The same applies to the legs, the same applies to any part of the body. It's much easier to project energy through the relaxed, soft, pliable tissues as compared to trying to do the same thing, sending the energy through tense muscles. Well, if there is any tension, it will rob you of power. So we learn how to stop using so much tension or how to stop being so tense. And when we become more relaxed, something else really cool happens. We experience ease. The blood flow, the lymph flow, the chi flow happens much more naturally and spontaneously throughout your organism. It's a lot easier to breathe when you're not tense. We actually don't even do breathing exercises. In our Qigong coaching program, I don't teach breathing exercises. Instead of trying to breathe right, we learn how to use breath as the barometer or as the gauge that actually tells you how much you're focusing on something that you resonate with or how much in the flow you are. If you are in the flow, or if you focus on something that you resonate with, which is pretty much synonymous, you experience ease, you experience relaxation, and your whole body feels optimized in terms of its physiology. So your physiology functions naturally and what can be healthier than being natural. But if there is tension, that means that you're either struggling against the flow or focusing on something you don't resonate with. And that creates tension. Where there is tension, there's going to be some energy blockages and it will restrict your breath. Now, if you have restricted breath and you try to do breathing exercises, for example, you're tense and you are being told by your teacher or your Qigong master, uh, you need to breathe deep into your stomach. You need to do the uh, diaphragmatic breath. Well, your diaphragm is stuck. You're tense. Now, you try to force it. It's possible to breathe into the uh, lower lobes of your lungs, but it's going to be difficult. And you will be accomplishing it by tensing up muscles antagonists, which means you're going to actually have twice as much tension. Well, who would want that? <laughs> That's exactly why so many people actually suffer from so-called chi deviations. What's the chi deviation? It's basically uh, a syndrome that people experience when they try to do qigong, especially in China. Those folks are really dedicated. They're really serious about learning how to do it right. So when they're being told by their teacher or their master to do something, they will do it. <laughs> and they actually do it to their own detriment. They add insult to injury. So what we do it instead is we use our own breath as the gauge. If my breath is stifled, well, that means that I'm not in the flow. I'm struggling against something. If I'm not aware of what I'm struggling against, well, maybe it's an invitation to become aware. It's an invitation to actually notice what it is that I'm focusing on that I don't resonate with, perhaps in my unconscious mind. Well, that may actually require connecting with your unconscious mind, which is a cool thing in and of itself. And if you become aware of your unconscious, guess what? You actually become conscious of it, which is pretty much the primary objective of uh, many schools of personal development to become conscious of that which you used to be unconscious. You become more aware. That's another definition of becoming conscious. As you become conscious of something, well, you become aware of it. 
if you're aware of something, guess what happens? You can do something about it. You can actually exercise freedom of choice. You cannot exercise freedom of choice regarding something that you're not aware of. For example, your tension. If you have unconscious tension, which is pretty much any chronic tension, nobody holds tension consciously on a chronic basis. All chronic tension is unconscious tension. And as soon as you become conscious of it, you'll become really sick and tired of, of holding it. Because it's really taxing, it's really tiring to hold tension consciously. Unconsciously, you can hold it for months and years and even, even decades. But if you become conscious of your tension, you will really quickly realize that nobody does it to you. You're doing it to yourself. And you will get sick and tired of doing it so that you will quit doing it. Basically, as you quit doing that, sending signals of contraction from central nervous system to your muscles, you have an opportunity to practice more weight. No one do it. Now, that's another really important aspect of Chinese philosophy, or I would prefer to call it Oriental philosophy because it doesn't just belong to China. But the idea is that you become aware of how much you're doing something that you would probably not want to do. As you become aware, then you have freedom of choice. Until that point, you really don't have freedom because you don't even know that you're doing it. So you can't quit doing it. Well, the same thing applies to a lot of principles of energy awareness. If you're not aware of those principles, you may be using them, you may not be using them. You don't know. So, for example, there are some people who instinctively are using principle of stabilization. They just are capable of standing on one foot like a stork for a really long time. And it seems like it's their superpower. Well, how do they do that? If they don't know what allows them to do that, they cannot teach it to anybody else. Because I know how I do it, I can actually teach it to others. But I'm going to do it in a smart way. Instead of just telling the person, well, you need to bring your center line and your toes together, I'm actually going to invite you to test everything such as, well, what happens if you don't bring your toes and your center line in alignment? What if you misalign yourself? For example, just turn a few degrees off and notice how that feels. You become much wobblier and less stable. And the farther away you rotate your center line away from your standing foot, the less stable you become. Or in other words, you destabilize yourself. Now, it's not the worst thing in the world that you do destabilize because that's exactly what allows you to step. You know? You don't step because you push off the ground. That would be called running or jumping. You step because you destabilize yourself. Or your center line is not in alignment with the toes of the weight bearing foot. So essentially, each step is a fall. I fall, but I don't fall on my face and place the foot in front of me before I fall down. And then I destable. And then I destabilize myself and take another step. And that becomes a series of falling when I step and I step and I step and I use gravity to do all the work for me. I'm not propelling myself forward. I'm just simply destabilizing myself so I start falling and then stabilize myself again. Maybe just for a split second and then destabilize and fall again. And that creates the continuous flow of movement, which by the way is not going to be straightforward. It's going to be a little bit of a zigzag line, like the boat tacking against the wind. So when I project energy forward with a forward push, I'm actually going to move slightly in a zigzag fashion. Now, what happens is also I want to keep the leg that I'm stepping with really relaxed. Why? 
because if I tense up that leg, I will land with a thud. Whenever I land with a thud, it means my kinetic energy drained into the ground. Now, if it happened after I delivered the strike or a punch, it's not a big deal. But if I land with a thud first and then try to punch or push, that's going to be difficult because all my kinetic energy is dissipated, turned into heat. I'm contributing to global warming. <laughs> now, what I do instead is I make the leg really relaxed at the knee. In fact, I bend the knee even while I'm traveling through the air with it so that I land a little bit later, just a split second later, which gives me the time to deliver impact into the target and then land. So instead of landing and absorbing the shock of landing with the shins, the muscles in the front of the the lower leg, which happens in the, inevitably when you roll from heel to toes. As soon as you land on the heel, you can track the shins so that you absorb the shock of landing. Instead of that, I always prefer to land with a soulful step. Soulful step means the sole of the foot lands pretty much flat as a pancake. It's not going to be perfectly flat because it has concave shape, like a suction cup. Well, great. So imagine suction cup stepping. You will immediately become connected to the ground or grounded as soon as you step with the entire sole of the foot all at once. But you can't absorb the shock of landing with shins because you're not landing on the heel. So what do you do instead? You use much larger muscle group. The largest muscle group in most people's bodies is the quadriceps, the thigh muscles. So instead of landing with the heel and absorbing the shock of landing with a relatively small muscle of shins or tibialis anterior, we use the quads. Quads are much stronger, much more capable. They will provide you much better softening of, or cushioning of the landing. And most importantly, it will allow you to deliver impact before you land it. So as you can see, several principles actually come together to support each other. As a matter of fact, there is another principle that I will divulge today, and it's the principle that many people, especially in boxing, um, never follow. It's the principle of rooting. Boxers, just like many martial artists in general, virtually always lift the back heel up in the air when they punch. I'm talking about the cross punch. I'm talking about the punch when you box and lift the heel. Sometimes they throw the hip and to purportedly add it to the power of the punch. <laughs> it doesn't really do squat. What would make a difference is to keep the back heel on the ground. Instead of lifting it and pivoting on the ball of the back foot, actually keeping the back heel on the ground. Why? Well, guess what? You need some kind of support from behind you if you want to project the energy forward. Otherwise, if there is nothing behind you, you will push yourself away from your intended target. If there is an insufficient support, such as when your heel is up in the air, you push yourself and you rely on the tension of the calves. Calves are never as strong as the bones of the leg. They may be stronger than shins, but they're definitely not as strong as the skeleton. And so what happens? <laughs> Those muscles basically uh, underperform as compared to the performance you can get out of bones. What we do instead is we learn how to keep the heel on the ground. What happens when you keep the heel on the ground? You have a leg to stand on, so to speak. You have the root. That's the principle of rooting. The root gets uprooted if you lift the back heel up. If you keep that heel on the ground, you immediately root yourself or you connect to the ground behind you so that when you project the energy in the opposite direction, you don't push yourself away from the target. That's something that is so paradoxical 
especially to people who've done a fair amount of boxing or other types of martial arts, that they often don't believe me. That's like, nobody does that. 99.9%, maybe 100% of all boxers lift the back heel up in the air. Well, they must be doing it for good reason, right? Well, I think they do it for some reason that is not so good. They do it because they try to reach farther. <laughs> they try to reach farther because they don't get close enough with their feet to their opponent. If you're trying to reach your opponent, it means you're too damn far away from the target. Now, what happens also is simple body geometry. If you're punching like this, guess what? This is like a triangle. One leg is the cadet, the floor surface is another cadet, and the back leg is hypothenuse. Now, hypotenuse is always supposed to be longer than any of the patterns. How do you elongate your leg? Well, if it doesn't telescope, then you'll probably just lift your back heel up in the air, and that's how you make it longer. You still try to reach the ground through the toes, but that's not going to do you much good. However, there is a much smarter way to deal with this geometry. If the uh, the hypothenuse is too long, or it needs to be shorter, you actually need to keep the heel on the ground, you need to make this cut it shorter. Make the other cut it also shorter. So you don't step that far forward, and you bend the front knee. Now people often say, well, your knee shouldn't project any further forward than the toes. It's only a problem if you do not observe the principle of grounding, which is distributing weight on the center of the foot. And besides, what happens when you squat or launch? The knee will project. That's not a problem. If you're squatting, by definition, virtually always, the knee is going to project further than your toes. What, is it a problem? No, it is not a problem. It is only an issue if your weight is on the ball of the foot, which is often what happens when people pay no attention to distribution of weight on their foot, which is the case with 99.9% .9 of all people, they don't pay attention to how they distribute weight on their feet. So they become ungrounded. If one leg, the front leg is ungrounded, and the back leg is uprooted because the heel is up in the air, yeah, of course they're toast. <laughs> But if you become grounded with the front leg and keep the back heel on the ground so you're rooted, then you're observing two very important principles that allow you to actually experience maximum efficacy in your movement and not have any problem with uh, uh, balance or stability, especially if you also align the toes of the weight-bearing foot with your center line you know, then you look at the golden. So what happens is that all of these principles work together. When they work together, they create synergy. What does synergy mean? It means that you get more benefits from combining uh, these principles together because they have a cumulative effect, as opposed to just using one of them or another at a time. So that's basically one of the principles of our art also. We call it principle of integration. We integrate instead of compartmentalize. We integrate in many different respects, in respect to using our principle of body awareness, in respect to using our consciousness and our body. We don't separate mind from the body. We also do this in respect to our energy centers. Instead of just picking one energy center and saying, Oh, I, I want to be always operating from my lower down tien, or hara. Or I always want to be in my heart, and I, I just want to be all love. Or maybe somebody may say, I, I just want to open my third eye, and I want to be operating on that energy center all the time. Well, it's like driving a car with a six-cylinder engine, except only one of those cylinders actually working. <laughs> How well would that work for you? 
we were basically learning how to operate on all the cylinders. We use them whenever most appropriate. So if one energy center or another is most usable under the certain circumstances, great. We use it, we take advantage of the fact that there is a resonance of that particular energy frequency and uh, the circumstances that you find yourself in. But as circumstances change, you also need to change which energy center you're using. So that creates a certain requirement for flexibility, or I would say agility of your energy use and also agility of your consciousness. And that's something that we pay a lot of attention to because it is the golden key that unlocks the door to resilience. If you want to be resilient, you need to have resources. Where do you get them? Well, it's not just you go out and find the resources somewhere. We actually find the resources within ourselves. And we basically have a lot more resources than we know about. And that's something that I would certainly love to continue working with you on. Exploring these resources, tapping into those resources, bringing them to the foreground, putting them in driver's seats so they become a driving force for as long as appropriate. And then put them in the passenger seat, <laughs> in the back seat, so that they don't drive it all the time because if the same resource drives you all the time, you deplete that resource. That's why people also experience adrenal fatigue or depletion or even burnout is because they used up their resources and they can't recover the, the resource. Well, that's because they relied on the same resource all the time, which is not a healthy way to be. We learn how to do all of this and a lot more. We learn how to get into a harmonious state of consciousness. And a harmonious state of consciousness, as name implies, allows you to experience greater harmony. We're talking about harmonious culture and movement. Well, guess what? Most people would have no problem getting into harmonious state of consciousness, maybe by meditating or listening to some nice music. But as soon as you get off the cushion or turn the music off, is you start moving. And if you move in a disharmonious manner, in a jerky start-stop manner, there is a disharmony in that culture movement. And it will easily pull you out of harmonious state of consciousness so you will no longer operate in a harmonious way of being. If you would like to be in a harmonious way of being, you would need to learn the harmonious culture movement that would actually sustain that harmonious state of mind. So when you move in a harmonious manner, you are the way you move. You actually become more harmonious as the organism, both mind and body and energy and everything in between, all working together in sync. That is exactly what I invited to experience with me. We are going to start our Qigong coaching program next week. And tomorrow is the deadline for registering for this program. So this is something that obviously I timed together with the Father's Day, with the summer solstice. I wanted to actually give you a special offer. And this is what I would like to offer to you. Actually, it's not just one but three really cool things that I wanted to offer to you. One of them is I'm going to give you as a gift the recording of the World Tai Chi and Qigong Day that we had a couple months ago. Several hundred people prepaid for this uh, recording of the World Tai Chi and Qigong Day. We have a lot of people who really excited about getting uh, this recording in their hands. Well, guess what? I'm actually going to give it to you for free when you register for our program by the end of this weekend. Another thing that I'm also going to give, it, give you is my best-selling online course called Fundamentals of Integral Martial Art. Free of charge, just for joining Qigong Coaching Program and registering before the registration ends on uh, Sunday at midnight. And the last but not least, I'm also 
we're going to offer you harmonious strength training course. That's right, we're talking about harmonious culture movement. Well, guess what? There's also a way to develop greater strength in a harmonious manner. Not to become forceful, but to become powerful. Tap into the inner strength. Instead of just bulking up and becoming like a bodybuilder, you actually can develop the ability to use your musculature much more efficiently. Why? Because most people don't use their muscles fully when they think that they are contracting muscles. Most people, when they contract the muscle, they send the signal of contraction, they only use actually maybe 10 or 15 percent of the entire muscle mass of that particular muscle. Why is that? Well, it's because the signals from the central nervous system don't quite make it to the muscle tissue. They don't quite get the uh, muscle fibers to fire. They may fire, but they fire later. That's why, for example, after working out, you may often feel like your muscles are tense. Why are they tense? Do you stop lifting the weights? Why are the muscles tense? Well, it's because the signals from the central nervous system are still percolating, making their way down to the muscle fibers, and that muscle fiber actually fires when it receives the signals. What we learn is how to train the communication between the central nervous system and the muscle fibers so that when you send the signals, the muscle contracts. And the much higher percentage of it contracts than 10 or 15 percent. Well, even if you just bring it to 30 percent, that already you will double or even triple your power without adding any more muscle mass. You just simply use more of that which you already have. Who wouldn't want that? But in addition to that, you also develop a much better ability to relax when you're no longer using contraction of the muscle. Meaning, when you stop sending signals of contraction, they're not percolating and taking this sweet time to get to the muscles and keeping you tense for several hours or even days after your workout. You know how you work out and you feel really pumped, then you go home, and then you sleep, you wake up in the morning, and you're feeling decrepit because you're seriously tense and stiff. Well, that shouldn't be happening when you go through my harmonious strength training program. And there are many other additional benefits that you'll discover when you start practicing with me. So this is, again, my invitation for you to dive into it and benefit as much as humanly possible from what I have to offer. And the cool thing about it is that you actually have two options. You can have an option to sign up for a three month program and just pay 500 bucks, actually even less, under $500. Or you can break it down into small monthly payments and pay under $200 once a month for the next three months. And that basically will stretch it out but still give you access to all the materials and all the bonuses that I offered. And you will even receive a private session from me. It literally is something that is worth admission to this program in and of itself. But I will give you a private session with no extra charge because I want to support you. And I would love to help you benefit as much as humanly possible from what I have to offer. So, what I invite you to do is to simply check out the link below this video, or if you have received my email, just click on the link in my email and enjoy this program as soon as it starts, which is going to be the end of June. We are finishing the registration tomorrow by midnight, and we're going to start the program next week. I look forward to working with you and having a great time the next three months exploring the Qigong coaching with you. Namaste.